Hello everyone and thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to give everyone a few more minutes to log in and get settled and we'll begin the webinar in about two minutes. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Customer Journey Mapping, the Swiss Army Knife of Insight Tools. A few logistical notes before we get started. You'll see two different ways to communicate with us throughout the webinar, the chat box and the Q&A box. Please use the chat box for all technical issues and the Q&A box for any questions related to the content of the webinar. With that, I'd like to introduce Zoe Dowling, our SVP of Research here at Focus Vision and Elisa Pollock of Elisa Pollock Consulting. An eclectic blend of researcher, technologist, sociologist, and marketer, Zoe uses her extensive research expertise to help clients best apply Focus Vision's technological solutions. Elisa has 20 years of international insights work and thrives on digging into the consumer's attitudes and behaviors and translating them into meaningful insights for brands. At this time, Zoe and Elisa are going to turn off their cameras and jump right into the presentation. Take it away. Thanks very much, Rachel, and good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for spending this, this next um, hour or so, or just under with us. Um, I am really very excited for this webinar today uh, with a, a, a former colleague and a good friend of mine, Elisa Pollock, who is just, I think, one of the most dynamic presenters and educators um, and so knowledgeable. So I am thrilled to have Elisa here uh, to talk to us about customer journey mapping. Um, I think this is going to be a good one. So Elisa, I think before we start, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you so much, Zoe. Hmm. I'm having a problem moving my um, my deck. Oh, there I am. Um, thank you so much, Zoe, and thank you everyone for making time for me today. Um, I am uh, an independent uh, insight consultant, brand consultant, and every permutation in between. Um, I love talking to people and thinking about why they do what they do and translating that information and helping my clients make more relevant products, make more relevant communications, come up with new product ideas and innovation. Um, just a little background on who I am. So um, I'm Canadian, um, which means that I'm a perpetual outsider because I started my career in England. So I was the Canadian in England. Um, I started in account planning because I loved thinking about, again, how consumers think, what they do, and, and helping ad agencies developing communications plans. Um, from England, I moved to the United States, to Los Angeles. Um, I worked for a qualitative market research company called QRC. I then um, got a little bored with advertising. I felt like it was, um, it just wasn't addressing the, the, the totality of the brand experience as much. So I went to work in brand strategy for a brand consultancy called Added Value. There I worked on brand strategy, on innovation projects uh, around the world. It was really, really fascinating. And I've been on my own for a couple of years. Um, and I, I truly love, um, I am a closet eavesdropper. And so now I'm a professional eavesdropper with it, which is awesome. I am also, um, as uh, I, I love to teach, I love to question, I love to provoke. I love to demystify. I think there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of jargon in our industry, across our industry. And I really love to um, 
kind of simplify it and make sure that people understand that, you know, with, with some key skills, some thinking, some, some working, many things are doable. And uh, I am a, a recreational teacher in that um, when I was younger, I would wake up my, um, my brother who's three years younger. So basically when I was nine, I would wake him up when he was six years old at like six o'clock in the morning on Sunday to teach him my math. So I love to teach. I will channel the good stuff of that. I don't think he, he enjoyed that experience as much as I did, but um, let's move on. So today um, we're going to talk about customer journey mapping. And I like to think about it as the Swiss army knife of inside tools because it is all about being flexible, being professionally flexible. And as an insight um, consultant or someone who is in charge of insights across marketing companies or um, in experience design, um, this is a great way of empowering all people within your organization. So I just want to um, give you a little sense of what we're going to be doing today so you can kind of orient yourself. I'm going to define journey maps. I'm going to show a case study really quickly and just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. I'm going to break down the process of how we create, how ultimately, what, we, what steps we go through to create journey maps and how we create a journey map. And then we're going to go through a, a QA. and a I'm going to try and keep this contained. Bear with me. I hope it works. Okay. So this is when we talk about journey maps, people also to call them experience maps, customer journey maps, or all sorts of language and, and words around them. These are just um, pieces that I picked up from the interwebs. Um, thank you, Adaptive Path. Thank you, all sorts of... Um, organizations that made them public, what I really wanted to do in sharing them with you is just show you um, just how visual they are, um, also how many uh, different components they are, just different um, elements of the life cycle you can see. There is a ton of information on these maps and something that is so powerful about them is how much information can be imparted in such enjoyable, entertaining, meaningful, resonant ways. So I'm not gonna go through any of this, but just to give you an idea, this is what we're talking about today. So if you were here to talk about digital marketing, you might be in the wrong place. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's define what a journey map is. Essentially, um, it's a breakdown of the end-to-end -end user experience, customer experience, consumer experience. It's really an inventory about the process that they go through. So um, what we're doing when we're inventorying these things is we're unpacking their steps, their, their behaviors, um, their attitudes across all touch points. So that means digital, in-store, marketing, customer service, call centers, all touch points, all the ways that the user engages with your brand. It could be light, it could be heavy, it could be passive, it could be active. We are trying to capture all that and understand um, the milestones, the delight points, the pain points. Yes, we want those pain points. That is good stuff, those pain points. We're gonna pull out and extract themes. Um, and we also, you know, we don't just want to capture and understand what they do practically, so what they might click or who they might engage with, but we also want to understand what they do, what they're thinking, what they're feeling emotionally while they're going through those actions. And as I said before, um, I, I call it the, you know, the Swiss Army knife of insight tools. Um, because of its versatility, it is, not only does it provide um, so much information um, so that your, your multiple teams can, can, can glean um, some, you know, sort of insights, uh, findings, directions from it, but it also is a tool that can be used for product, it can be used for brand, it can be used for category exploration, it can also be used for, um, for services. So you really can map the process that your user goes through across all these different um, disciplines. Now, there are two kinds of maps. Uh, there's the retrospective journey map. So this is um, the process that your team believes happens with your user. So this is, you know, based on um, you being, or your brand, your product, your team, being in the market for a period of time, and having some kind of data 
on which to develop hypotheses. So these are your accumulated thoughts and data and insight into how your user, um, how your user operates. And there's also the perspective journey map. So this is the process that the team hopes will happen with your user. So this is mostly for new to market products, you know, either based on some consumer insight, some hypotheses around the white space in the category. It's really kind of a projection of, of what you think your, your customer or your user will do. And today, this is where we're gonna focus. We're gonna focus on um, retrospective maps. So just going in a little to um, what I love about um, this tool is um, this is a photograph from a photographer whom I love named Uta Barth. And uh, what I love about her work is that it's so, it seems very obvious. It seems almost like uh, very, very blurred and hazy, but there's so much detail in here and there's so much that can be revealed. And uh, if you just look a little deeply, and that's what I feel a journey map is. It reveals what's very much hidden in front of you. So when I look at this image, you know, you could see orange. That's true. You could see orange, um, but you can also see the gradations of orange. And you can also see light and darkness. So you see shading. And you can also see the objects here. Oh, I see a window, I see the wall, I see the couch. Ah, so it's, it's being more, more fleshed out, more details coming into, into clarity. You can also see texture, there's roughness, there's softness. So there are all these, these nuances here um, that we see in this photograph, but also that we can get from, from journey maps. And why is that? First of all, it's cross-disciplinary in design. So because we're thinking and talking holistically about the product or the organization or the category or the brand, we have to bring in a range of departments in order to understand our context. So marketing is involved, customer experience is involved, CRM is involved, experience is involved, creative is involved, product design is involved. I mean, this is a tool, you know, often we, we work in very siloed way, but this is a tool that requires everybody to, to come together and really collaborate from the beginning. <clears throat> so it's brilliant for us to start like this, but it's also brilliant for us when we end at our end point to be able to come back together and uh, it just kind of helps for, for buy-in, it helps for momentum. Something that I also love about it is that it gives us all the feels. So it's not just the practical, as I said before, it's also um, the practicality, the practical wrapped in emotions. So it really contextualizes um, behaviors emotionally. And this is incredibly important because it lends itself to great storytelling, which lends itself to better um, product integration. You know, if you're working with um, a design team, it's so much more helpful, inspiring to talk about the whole person, not just, um, you know, how the person kind of clicks here and then and moves there and, and kind of looks for a, a recipe there or a moment there, but how they feel when they're looking for that recipe or how they are in that moment. It just helps all your teams understand uh, the big picture around your, your consumer. Another thing that I truly love about it is that um, it almost feels incredibly obvious, like it's some sort of trick. It's no trick. Um, you know, the point is to lay out your steps and your missteps so the team can focus on opportunity building. And, you know, in, in, in my work, I also work on marketing and positioning and brand strategy. And a lot of times that's so incredibly nuanced. And finding the nugget there is so ephemeral. And what I love about using this tool, this journey mapping tool, is that it lays everything out for you. It feels so almost literal. But what that does is that it, it, it clears the space for you to be innovative. Um, and and, and, and what, the, what that means is that ultimately you, um, it helps you you know, create a roadmap for marketing or product development. Because you have all the steps, all your teams can really see what they can build and when, and, um, and it helps them kind of plot out what their next steps are, what their professional um, schedule can be, roadmap can be. And often, you know, if you're working with jobs to be done, you can overlay your jobs to be done 
on top of your, your journey map so you can understand you know, what to build when, what sort of jobs you are uh, solving for. So that's some great detail about what this is all about and <clears throat> how, to, how to think about it. Well, let's get into the, the nitty gritty now. You know, what are the, the steps that we go through? So um, I, I wanted to show you just a little bit of um, a journey map. This is something that I put together for um, a heart medication brand. And I'm just taking you quickly, although possibly not quickly enough, just taking you through um, the, the path that people go through. I just wanted to give you an idea live of um, how this tells a story and how this imparts information. So I'm not gonna go through the whole details, but something that I wanted to, just in, in setting up, when my, this client came to me, they really didn't know anything about their, their users, their patients. Most of their information came through doctors, um, came through sales associates. So it was really third level information about their customers. And they had put together some kind of journey where they thought, okay, our, our, our patient is, is symptomatic here, they go to the doctor here, um, they start on the medication here, and they really thought that basically at a year, that um, at a year people are um, starting to think about a different medication. And so we went into the process thinking, all right, at the, thinking through that th this is the, the, the idea of the life cycle that we're gonna work against, and we'll see what happens when we talk to our patients. And, and uh, we, we went through the whole process and we interviewed people. And um, what we were able to do is really break apart the process in, in much more granular and much more helpful detail. detail. So we, we, we noted that there's a symptomatic phase um, and there was an early stage to that and a later stage to that. We noticed that in diagnosis and treatment, there was like a track A where you can accept something, track B where you're actually in grief, we noticed that in the initiation stage, that there was an um, there were there were two kind of uh, reactions they could have. We noticed also that in the adherence stage, when they were taking the medication, that it was actually uh, a much longer experience, and um, and actually at the year mark, people were still I think this is a medical term. They were still freaked out, and they would not actually start considering another option. They were still very much connected to their doctor, very much thinking about, well, how do I address this heart issue? So um, basically, I just wanted to show you this, which has a ton of information, but I just wanted to show you how um, you can go in with an hypothesis, which is really important, um, and, and find out as you're talking to people and is thinking through the information that you're gathering, that you're, you're finding new opportunities, you're finding new avenues, new experiences for them. Um, I also just wanted to show you a couple of key elements of um, a, a map. So you can see that, that it's so important to break it into digestible parts. So you know we've got those phases, we've got an early stage, we've got the emotions, we've got the practical actions, um, we've got two different engagement experiences, we've got all these storytelling elements, their actual quotes, um, icons, just to help it feel much more visual. And um, something that I also like to point out, because if you're used to doing market research, your experience with the customer often stops with the purchase. And with a journey map, you want to go beyond the purchase. You want to go, you want to follow the, the user, whomever that person is, all the way through um, to all kind of logical touch points and engagements. And that happens after purchase, which is a really fun thing to do to really follow through the entirety of the life cycle. So I know I went by uh, that really quickly, but that was the point. I wanted to go by there really quickly. Um, I actually want to get very much into um, the process that we go through in order to build these things. So we have um, benchmark, discovery, synthesis, visualize, and action. Benchmark is um, a stakeholder download. So stakeholder download is, is just if you've you know, done marketing work, if you've done inside work, this is just your classic stakeholder phase. And what you really wanna do here is get your brain trust together and mine what you have. So all the intelligence, all the experience, all the institutional knowledge, you really wanna identify what's known 
and what's unknown. Importantly, as I said before, from the beginning, you know, you have this incredible range of this, uh, you know, buffet of stakeholders, and that's what you want. You really want to bake in diversity of thought. You really want to understand what your, your um, CX people are thinking, what your marketing people are thinking about, about the business, about the, about the customers. Um, you know, you, you really want to kind of approach your problem at this phase, at the beginning phase, from um, multiple different angles, just so that you can understand the complexity that you're about to enter into, uh, just, you know, all, all the dimensions of the business. You know, as with all stakeholder experiences, you, you want to develop buy-in, you want to develop ownership. This is incredibly important for your, for your, your back end when you emerge with this incredible map. You want people to actually feel like they can own it and do something with it as opposed to have it rest on a, um, have it rest on a shelf somewhere or in a server somewhere and just kind of be, be virtually dusty. Um, you know, and, and, and what you really want is just to kind of emerge from this session with um, some hypotheses. And even if you, just like in that case study with the heart medication, even if you dispel some elements of your hypotheses, it's just something to work against and to check against. It's a, it's a great way to start. And even if you kind of um, blow it out, that's brilliant for you. So how do we do this? How do we talk to our stakeholders? Any way you can, any way that you can, any way that you can access your people, any way that you can wrangle their schedules, any way that you can get as much um, collaboration and connectivity as possible. So you can certainly do, you know, individual IDIs via phone, 45 minutes. You get them on the way to the airport, no problem. If you can, get them in a stakeholder workshop, maybe two and a half hours, give them some lunch, give them some food, that always goes a long way. Um, just to help them, you know, download their perspective on the business, uh, what they want to get out of the experience. You can do open-end surveys. You can do a data dump. If you are the insight person, um, you can dump everything that you have. Um, and of course, you can do desk research. Perhaps they've already mined this and there are some ingoing hypotheses. Perhaps there are some, uh, some journey maps already. So, the next step is discovery. We want to check in with users. Really, this is all about finding out what are they doing and for goodness sakes, why are they doing that? So what do we do for this? Um, in terms of your scope, it's very much project dependent as we as we have all done before, you know, and thinking through how to design a project. Um, it's hard for me to say here how to think about who you talk to, um, how many engagements you have with them. But I would say, um, as a general rule, you really want to think about your key variables that are impacting the user experience. So you want to think about demographics. You want to think about behaviors. Do they need to be driving X many times a week? Do they need to be cooking X many times a day? Um, you also want to think about, okay, do we have any personas? Do we have segments? Do we want to think about creating um, segment-specific journeys? Do we not know our segments? Do we not know our people? I did a project for um, a recipe demo site that had grown exponentially and organically on um, social media, but they didn't really understand who their users were and how they were using their product. So we didn't have any um, segments. We just had ideas of who was using, and we, we talked about frequency, you know, people who are, who are using it X many times a, a week, and people who are using it X many times a month, and it just helped get us to, um, you know, uh, a, a good starting point. You know, um, what you want to think about if you don't have these personas, if you don't have this information, you want to think about users, you want to think about non-users, you want to think about lapsed users. I mean, the, the thing is here is that you, you, you want to talk to those people who don't like your product anymore. That is information that is incredibly helpful to your cross-disciplinary teams. Why did they stop with us? Why did they drop us? Why did they lapse? What did they go to? It's all really valuable information. Um, 
And I would say that um, as a rule of thumb and thinking about the scope, you want to have maybe four to six interviews per set or pure, per, per variable. And just a reminder that this is still qualitative. So uh, you want to make sure that you can manage the data coming in. You know, you're, you're not going for, um, you know, like huge, a huge sample here. You're really going for a manageable representative sample so that you can get, um, you know, a, a good idea of how people are performing and what they're doing. And in terms of method, my, my philosophy here and the, the principle that I work on is that you want the most pristine information. And what that means is that um, you really want to talk to people in their own context and on their own so that they're not influenced by other people. So I prefer doing IDIs, just 45 minutes or one hour IDIs. You can do them virtually, you can do them in person, you can do it in people's homes. Um, I prefer doing that over focus groups because you, you just want people to speak to their experience and you don't want any of that, um, any of that kind of focus group influence of, oh yeah, I do that too. And um, yeah, that's great. I love that. Um, and then all of a sudden people have changed their, their conversation about their behavior. Something that is also important about this work, because we are asking people to, um, use recall and we all know that recall can be a little dodgy so um, it's helpful to um, think about uh, hybrid methodologies so i often do pre or post task diaries you know give them some sort of template that helps them think through how they're using social media or how they're using your app or how they're using your your product and have them kind of record it a couple of days before you actually meet with them so you can ground them in the information they can be grounded in the behaviors and in the thinking and you can actually capture what they're doing versus what they think they're doing you know you can combine this with diaries you can buy this with um, social media listening if you're working if you've got data analytics on your team or in your organization this is a great way of combining forces i also recommend if you can um, think about what artifacts can help substantiate what your users, what your respondents are saying. You know, think about, um, I worked, I did a project for um, uh, a bank. So we had people bring in their credit card statements, you know, nothing extremely personal, but kind of personal, uh, personal enough, enough so that they can reference what they actually purchase. And then you can talk about the real, the real things in their lives. For that uh, healthcare study, we had people bring in uh, receipts from um, medical, uh, medical appointments, you know, every kind of healthcare uh, explanation of benefit they could get their hands on their calendar so we could see actually when they went to when when they went to um, the doctors any sort of emails that they had where they were you know going back and forth between partners husbands and wives um, parents doctors talking about symptoms not understanding symptoms anything that can help shore up their recall with um, actual captured information is incredibly helpful in helping you paint a very true picture of the experience. And um, as with all qualitative work and, 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 and work in which you have some stakeholder uh, connection, these interviews are a fantastic way of including your stakeholders and um, re really involving them in the experience. And you know how um, a picture is worth a thousand words, well, a story is worth a thousand pictures. I'm just going that, could be lame, but I just coined that. Um, so what I mean by this is that, you know, a lot of designers uh, work on their own and they're really thinking about designs and materials and what's new and what they most clickable and, and and you know most clean and their perspective is very much about design and it's really uh really kind of punctures that 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 balloon that they're in to go to someone's home and watch them as they talk about um you know how they maneuver and, and navigate the healthcare industry or how they cook 
when their children are running around and what cooking does for them or how they, you know, look for a car, how they do um, car uh, research, even though they're not looking for a car. Those types of human experience really resonate with people who don't normally deal with their users. Okay. Moving on to the discussion guide, which is, um, you know, obviously the, the, the core element of your um, user engagement experience. So this guide is plotting. It is not at all sexy. What do I mean by that? You know, basically you are trying to capture as much information as possible. So if you're if you're used to working with brands and brand side or creative and you're, you're using projective techniques to get it, you know, underlying emotions and, and the subconscious and associations, mm, that's not so much what you're doing here. Um, this is really much about capturing steps and uh, you're really asking and what happened then and then and then and perhaps then and why is that and tell me more. And perhaps a bit more so um, it's fun I mean if you like talking to people this is always great work but it is different from you know doing if you're if you're if you if you're used to working in communications development and you're you know kind of used to exploring a concept or communications uh, categories or, or territories uh, one thing that you want to do when you're thinking about your discussion guide, because you're going to be going through a lot of information, is really try, and hopefully you will have done this with your stakeholders at the beginning of the process, really try and work out what you think the experience flow is. So just as a framework for how to ask questions, going back to that example of the heart medication, you know, we had worked out with the team, okay, there is this process where you're, you're fumbling around, you're feeling symptoms, you're symptomatic, and you're researching. And then there's this process where you're, you're, you're with doctors. Maybe you're not being diagnosed, but you're in the medical community. You're, um, you're, it's a little bit more directed. And then you get to this point where, okay, you're diagnosed. What happens when you're diagnosed? It's really helpful just for yourself and for your team to think through these, um, these elements of the life cycle on your own and, 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 and create your questions or line of questioning within them just to keep you organized because you can go through a ton of information. It just helps you think in, in a framework before you actually have to develop a framework. So what's next? Next is mixing it up. Um, synthesis in any way that you you're used to doing it you know how to do it um, any analysis system that works for you so if you like to code things or if you use spreadsheets or quotes or um, data analytics you know go at it um, for work like this I also like to um, partner so it's great if you, if, say if you're doing segments, someone owns one segment, you own another segment, that way um, you can kind of talk to each other about what you're finding and understand what the distinctions are between people. Um, if you can't find a partner who can actually do the field work with you, which is not always you know, possible, it's great to find a naive partner, someone who you can tell the story to and they could poke some questions into your thinking in a generous and, and gentle way. Um, but it's really nice to have someone who has been removed from where you were, which is the weeds, because you're going deep into the weeds here. Someone who doesn't know anything and um, really just listens to you and, and functions naively and with curiosity just to help you flesh out your story, build it out, understand where, where points are. Um, a, a case in point, a partner and I were working on this um, this recipe demo site that was, uh, as I said, it, it grew really quickly and organically on social media. And we were just talking to a peer who didn't know anything about what we were doing. Um, but we were very much in the weeds because social media is so incredibly passive and people didn't fully know what they were doing. And as we, as we, as we told him the story of how people were, um, using the product across social media, across different media, on their app, not on their app, 
he, he noticed at a certain point, oh, so they're going off the, the tool completely. And we realized, oh my God, they are. I mean, we were so immersed in the details and, and kind of getting to the, the end, which is, okay, now we've finished. Um, we didn't realize that they actually hopped off the tool and used something else to capture all their information. And that is a great, that ended up being a really great um, product, a really great opportunity for um, product development and develop a product feature. So get that partner, even if you're grabbing someone at the coffee shop, have them sign an NDA. Okay, next. Um, frameworks and deliverables. So as with all work, uh, you know, really talk to your client in advance. Uh, to understand what their needs are. Do they need a report? You know, you're, do they need big posters? Do they want this uh, sketched out? Do they want this looking really finished and um, polished? You know, you want to have some details in advance because it helps you think about the conversation. It helps you um, really prioritize how you're telling your story. Um, do they want separate journeys? You know, if you have Maybe if, if you're finding that there are two different tracks that one persona goes on, do they want to separate that into two different journeys? Do they want to include opportunities? What kind of language do they want to use? Some people like using the language trigger, what triggers. Some people just want to talk about motivations, needs. I mean, you know, this is just a, a general conversation that helps your client um, firm it out in their own head about how the, the, what the company culture is and what's going to resonate most when this project is finished. Also, I want to invite you to uh, explore just a little tool, just a simple tool called Google. It's your friend. There are so many charts. There are so many frameworks. There are, there are so many examples of journey maps just to um, get your eye used to thinking about how to build these things, how to compartmentalize them, how to break down the various, um, the various uh, dimensions or elements of the life cycle. So I would say um, take a look, keep it quasi controlled because it could be a, a total wormhole, but definitely have a look through for inspiration. Oh, and, and just work your facial hair like this guy. Just, it works well. <laughs> so it's a little joke for myself. Um, okay. Next step, which is incredibly important, is um, visualization. So, you know, sometimes clients that I've worked with have only wanted the poster. They don't want the report. Some do want a report. Some do want, you know, uh, more, uh, more depth of each um, element of the life cycle, but really think from the beginning about visualizing um, because for the most part, as I think we all know, nobody reads anymore and designers don't read. And I don't think that's, um, that's not an insult. You know, they'll tell you that they're visual. So that's why going with designers on your, you know, your user engagements or having them log into those, in those um, interviews is so helpful because they can actually hear the stories and see the user in their home and understand that um, the experience is not so perfect. So think visually. Um, you can think about posters. Uh, sometimes we put together podcasts, which is a lot of fun. Just kind of taking, um, just taking your, your client team um, through the, the persona and the journey that they go through. Think about museums, you know, like if you're presenting, can you bring some artifacts from the user experience into the room to really bring out the stories? Obviously think about video, but this is just something um, to be cognizant of from the beginning of the process and even a bit before, um, you know, how can I visualize this? How can I make this something that feels alive and that feels like it could be um, actioned upon, you know, that inspires people. And I, I think like there's so much great visual inspiration and stimulation around us, but I, I always point people to, you know, newspapers um, and the business section of newspapers or something like Fast Company, they're constantly playing around and thinking through how they can visualize some incredibly dry data. 
So that's a place just to go to, to start training your brain and your eye for um, how to represent information visually. And of course, you got to talk to your client in advance. What do they need? You want to create something that's going to land in the organization that's going to have resonance, that's going to inspire people. Finally, our last stage is um, action planning. So this is something that I love to um, add into any project. Um, I always put it in there. It doesn't always doesn't always sell, and they don't always uh, clients don't always go for it. But what I love about it is that, um, especially for journey maps, they are so actionable, and it's such a shame they are so uh, packed with information. It's such a shame if they were to just you know land on the proverbial um, shelf and not have anything done about them. So you know what can you do? to propose some sort of action into the work into the workflow how can you help the client commit you know what does success look like for them is it a certain visual that can be replicated and you know put up on walls and shared um, across the organization is a video is it a video is it a podcast that people can listen to that salespeople can listen to in their cars when they're going on all their meetings so that they can you know, really integrate the process and really integrate who the user is and what that what user does and what they feel. Is it a workshop? I personally love a workshop. Um, but essentially, um, can you build something that helps the team act on challenges? So this doesn't have to be a full day session. You know, you can have a short sprint session where you're, you're getting uh, a host of designers together, a host of developers together. I don't know who you're working with in your organization, but you can, you know, a quick debrief and, and, and walk through and animate the um, quick debrief uh, to, to animate the journey and then set your designers on sprints and see what they create. I did that with a, um, um, a car purchase uh, uh, website and uh, we had some personas that they really wanted to understand how they engage with their product but how they think about cars in general and how they think about um, browsing and researching and involving themselves in the car world and we, 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 we came back and we put together we were able to uh, put together some personas and put together um, a pretty solid journey map, with, which we shared in a very informal way. I mean, I, I, we didn't even have a full report. We were working with post-its and um, and with markers, so not even like a, a not even a, a poster that I have shown you here. And and we just kind of set you know twenty designers and developers off for forty five minutes at a time just creating possible features that can deliver to some of the pain points that our users had shown us. And it was really great. You know, they, they went off, that was an afternoon, and ultimately the organization, you know, within their own time, they decided, okay, what can we prioritize here? You know, what can we actually work on based on the resources that we have, the competencies that they have, but at least they had like 20 ideas to work off of. So that's pretty exciting when you not only create this map, but you have, um, you know, the, the whole culture, um, you know, engaged and involved, and you've got 20 product ideas, you know, ultimately, I would say one and a half to three are going to be actually functional. I think that's a, a really good show. So, um, <clears throat> That is um, what I have. I think I raced through it, but I was excited. Um, and now I just want to uh, open it up to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Eliza. I think that was, was really informative um, okay. and very visual. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank I know we, we've got a good number of questions. I'm first going to address um, a couple of people that asked what an IDI uh, is. Sorry, everybody. Um, I, uh, that is um, a one-on-one -on -one interview. There we go. And I know a, a number of people have put in some answers uh, to, to help people out as they're going along, so that's much appreciated. So let's start from the top and see how, how far we get. So um, the first question is, is, 
how about the map that is an actual experience that happens with the user that's screened by one-to-one -one interviews? So I think that was going right back to the early on when you were talking about, you know, today's about the, what we believe happens versus what we hope happens. And I think that they would suggest, you know, is what we believe happened, is that the actual experience? Um, or is that just um, uh, what you think happens? When it's the retrospective map, it is. It should be grounded in data at that point. Hopefully, your product, your brand, your your the, the the category has been existence for enough time that you've you've developed some some data, and um, you're you're somewhat grounded in um, how things work. The prospective map is very much about like a, a new category, you know, a white space thing when you think. Oh, I believe that you know people definitely need um, I don't know uh, you know lights all around their bicycles. That's actually neat. But um, so basically, you're kind of conceiving of how they would get to your your the lights on your tires, and you're imagining uh, you know with experience, you know understanding of the market, but not that kind of tactical. Um, you know, true uh, connection to your product. So the retrospective is you've got experience in the category with the brand, with the communications, you've got some kind of data just to develop your hypotheses. Okay, great. So another question, um, and I think you, you perhaps covered this, but, but just I think good to reiterate, what research techniques are commonly used to get to the journey map? Um, sure. And they, they talk about internal stakeholders, external customer needs assessment. What helps you uncover the steps best? Right. Um, well, for for me, the ideal in a stakeholder with a with a sort of stakeholder download is some sort of quick workshop where you get everybody together, so you can really download all the information across customer experience, across marketing, across sales if it's relevant. Um, it's so helpful to get all those people together and and sharing. It's helpful if you can get them together in person. It's really so much more pleasant and it's so much more efficient. It doesn't always work, but I do find that a little bribe of food or lunch helps. Um, so for stakeholders, I like when we can clump them all together and just just download and have some key conversations about what we, who we think the user is, how do we think the user goes through this, why, um, a really efficient way of using their time. Uh, if you don't have all of them together, then um, phone conversations are great, uh, video conversations, you know, one-on-one, -on -one. if you've got two-on-one, -on -one. anything that enables you to get access to them relatively quickly, in a relatively efficient way because it's just notoriously difficult to wrangle people's schedules. So I think the goal there is whatever helps you, um, whatever helps you understand their perspective as much as possible. Personally, desk research or working with um, working with kind of their 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 data without having someone shepherd it or champion it or or speak to it. I find it a little dry, not incredibly helpful, but it is something and it can give you some sort of framework to work against. Again, even if you blow it out, at least you have something there. So for, for stakeholders, um, my go-to is some sort of quick workshop, you know, two and a half hours with lunch. Um, notice I'm always talking about lunch. It's really, really seductive. <laughs> um, really seductive goes a long way. Um, now, with consumers or users, uh, I personally like one-on-ones. You can do um, an hour with one person and get a lot of information about, you know, how they um, how their research cars or how they, um, you know, have uh, for the, for that uh, heart medication um, project. It's very intimate. Um, that's very intimate information. It's a very intimate experience. We did three hour ethnographies with people. We went to people's houses. It was incredibly interesting and important to be able to see them surrounded by their things, to see their loved ones there, to understand the full context of their, um, their lives and where this health issue um, fits in there. So I would say that, you know, 
ideally ethnographies in people's homes are fantastic that's rarely possible so how do you approximate that you can do video uh, interviews with them you can use all sorts of their artifacts you know things in their home have them open up the fridge for you to understand you know what they juice if they juice what what sort of vitamins they use what their medicine cabinet looks like you know they can show you their um, health statements via uh, online so i would say for me um something one-on-one -on -one is in, much more helpful to this process because you're really talking to the person and you're thinking with them about their process i find that in a focus group it's just um I don't want to say the risk, but it's too easy for people to change behavior because other people do certain things. So I would stay away from the focus group on this, though it's doable. That's not my ideal. Makes sense. Um, so I, uh, th there's a number of kind of linked questions. So, so one of them would be, um, what about validating with quantitative research? Because we're talking about this a lot on qualitative. Have yeah. you ever done that? Is there a need to do that? Does that help? I mean, again, in terms of the buy-in? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, so a lot of times we've done quant after we've developed the, the, uh, the, the journey and, mm -hmm. and being able to, to validate it. And, but you need the qual, you need the detail and the nuance of the qual. And I'm not just saying that because um, that's my background. Um, but you do need uh, all that you can get from qual, all those observational details, all those um, things that people don't say, but their gestures reveal something else. You need that detail in order to put together um, a human map. Mm. You know, this is about talking and inventorying human experiences, human behaviors, and human emotions. So I would say start with your qual and absolutely um, do some quant afterwards. I mean, I've had people who've not done that, but it helps in. Yeah. Um, in just embedding it within an organization. Yeah, and I, for me, that kind of answers the, uh, another question. It's about validating the journey to silence naysayers. Yes. For me, if, if you're bringing together the, you know, I, I agree, um, and as a fellow quali, uh, I know we both particularly believe in the, the qualitative side, the human journey, yeah. and really getting that detail. But the quantitative, you know, it helps validate what you've done and it helps uh, provide some numeric backup. And that um, both of those together really helps get that sure. in an organization. And, and can I just say building on that Zoe, yeah. um, naysayers, yes, that's definitely a component of this. If you can, uh, it helps to get them on your engagement. So going to someone's house or even watching them talk about their experience, it's so memorable and it just it really just imprints on people's minds that we're, we're talking about humans there. So so that is also a way to address naysayers, but you know, quant is like the mother of all ways so yeah no i, I get that um there's uh, questions around timing so and so the, and there's two two um and for the sake of time i'm, I'm sort of yeah. synthesizing a number of different questions together so there's, there's two aspects to it how long does a journey map take overall and then also what kind of percentages of the the, the project's time on stakeholder and discovery versus actually talking to the the, the customers um, and all the other people, as well as also just had you know the time to, to analyze and, and actually build the visualization and build right, an action right, plan. Right, right, right. Okay. So um, this is probably like a uh, you know it, it really depends on on the on the scope and how many people you're talking to, but I would say that this is probably like a nine or ten week process. So you have one week for that stakeholder, that benchmarking period of time, which is just um, your, uh, as many interviews as you can do that will get you the information that are not going to, but, but, but not wasteful, you know? So don't waste your time here. You know, if you have five key areas that you, you need to make sure <coughs> that you're addressing customer experience, marketing, sales, I don't know who it is, make sure that you represent them. Maybe politically, you need to make sure that people feel like they're a part of something, make sure you represent them. So I would say, you know, a week for the stakeholder experience with some sort of quick top line, just summarizing what you heard and helping you, um, you know, orient yourself for the next phase, which is the user experience 
and um, your, your field work. You know, your field work is usually, uh, it's probably like a, a two week recruit time. So you can actually recruit um, while you're doing some of your stakeholder work if you really know who your users are. So you've got, you know, two weeks to recruit. I would say one or two weeks of field work, depending on who you're talking to, how many people you're talking to, and how you're talking to them. You know, ethnographies, three hour ethnos, you can only do two a day in a major metropolitan area because you're stuck in traffic for the majority of time. So, you know, but if you're doing uh, one hour interviews with people, you can do many virtually, you can do a lot in a week. So it really depends on who you're talking to and how you're talking to them. Usually um, after I finish um, in, in the field work, I take two weeks to, um, to consolidate the information for analysis and synthesis. Um, and within that period of time, I'm working with a designer. So, um, and then maybe at that, after that two week part, you're talking to your main client, you're talking them through the major points of your journey, you're taking them through a sketch of your journey, nothing, nothing beautiful, but definitely something that looks representative. And, you know, it's a draft, but it's definitely closer to the end draft than, than the beginning, which is just post-its on a wall. Um, and then, you know, videos take a little bit longer, but probably, you know, you can sort of overlap in that analysis synthesis period. You can overlap some of your creation, creation time, creation, creative time. So if you're, you've got the report, um, and, and a video is, um, kind of like a synthesis or a, a shorter report, um, then you, you, you almost have a treatment for your video producer. And, um, if you're doing the video, then obviously you need to give yourself some time. But if you're outsourcing it to someone who can do the video, which I wholly recommend, um, and there's so many people available on Upwork who are great video producers that can help you, um, you know, then you can actually do these things at the same time. But I would say give yourself, you know, ideally this is 10 weeks, um, nine or 10 weeks, and you can find some time and overlap some things to maybe shave off you know, seven days somewhere there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Elisa. Look, I, I, um, we're, we've got just a minute or two left. There's actually a lot of questions. Um, I think, uh, Elisa, if you're happy for people to reach out to you, your, either your email is there. It uh, is. Mine is also there. Um, with a typo, uh, which was oh. very poor of me. There's missing an I in vision. Oops. I know. Oops, indeed. So, um, <laughs> at focus, V I S I R N dot com. Um, and um, please, please do keep the questions coming and, and reach out to us directly. We'd be glad to answer. I know there was a, um, a lot around costs, um, mm. more about the timing, more about how do we visualize this, mm -hmm. um, also about the steps and breaking out. There's a great one about, and I do think I want to end with this one is who actually commissions uh, the, the journey map? Is it, is it marketing? Is it others? Is it sort of a, a uh, does it vary per organization depending on how it wants to be used? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so it really depends. I mean, sometimes it's come from marketing because they simply like that, that health project that I did, it came from marketing. They really didn't understand their patient experience and they couldn't, they had ideas about what they wanted to create in terms of um, you know, patient materials in the doctor's office, uh, websites, etc. but they really didn't know what to create when. So it was very much a, a marketing issue. Uh, for the case of the recipe demo site, it really came from the product team. They just didn't understand how people were using, how people were using the tool, but marketing was involved because it was necessary for them and product, you know, product was involved because they wanted, they were, they built an app and they wanted people to, to move on to the app. Um, customer experience was involved again. Um, so retail was involved because they wanted to, to, to innovate and they had ideas about retail innovations. So it, it comes from everywhere. I would say that the key question that kind of cues you or clues you into why you need to do this is when any client comes to you and says, I don't understand how my users are connecting with my product, my brand, my service. Um, and, and I really need to understand the totality of it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to quickly answer one of the questions around how can we use focus visions tools sure. to do this. And basically it's the full spectrum. 
So if you want to start with the qualitative side and you want to do in-depth interviews, you could use our online uh, interviewing platform, Interview. Um, if you want to get some of the rich uh, data, you know, Elisa talked about, hey, you know, capture some of the, the artifacts like receipts or like email conversations or just have them do a diary, then we could use uh, Focus Vision Revelation. And of course, all the video data you can collect can go into Video Insights. And for that all-important quantification, um, the cipher is available. So using our tools in conjunction with somebody like Elisa, uh, who can, can bring it all to life and actually get the data that you need um, that's how you can go about uh, practically, practically doing this. We are out of time, Aliza. This has been fantastic, as seen by some of the, the great questions that's come in. Um, really appreciate uh, you spending uh, the time with us this morning and a lot everybody else that joined us um, online. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we hope to see you at a webinar soon. Thank you so much, everybody. And as Zoe said, I invite you to ask me questions. This is really thrilling for me. I told you that I am that closet teacher. So um, feel free to send those questions and I'll do my best to answer them. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Zoe. And thank you so much to you and Elisa for joining us today. What a wonderful and informative presentation. Unfortunately, it looks like we've reached the end of our time together. If there are any questions that did not get answered today, we'll follow up soon. Or you can email Zoe or Eliza at the email addresses shown on the screen or webinars at focusvision.com and we'll follow up rather soon. We hope you enjoyed the webinar, Customer Journey Mapping, the Swiss Army Knife of Insight Tools. We hope to see you in the future. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.